Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And this is part two of the series we started. Uh, it's titled uh, MacArthur, Piper, and Washer versus uh, John, Peter, and Paul. Or as uh, Sister Lisa Harang says, it is uh, probation versus salvation. <laughs> All right, so well, this is part two, but uh, uh, anybody who is watching this now, if you did not watch part one, it is posted on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. You should go watch it. It's about two hours long. We covered a lot of material already. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go back and just uh, take a, just a couple minutes to recap some of the main points, and then we're going to move on. But uh, first, let me introduce the panelists now. Uh, first, we're going to, I'm going to tell them your name, and then you just tell them a little bit about you, your ministry, and uh, your YouTube channel, if, if you have one. And uh, first, we've got Brother Eric. Hello. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank and you. And tell the, tell the world, who, who is Brother Eric? Well, um, uh, I've been saved for uh, about 20 years now. I've uh, been since then uh, studying the scriptures uh, as much as I can. I uh, can't get enough of it. <laughs> uh, I teach my family um, in a uh, in a home church that we have here. I'm uh, Holy Spirit taught. You know, I haven't gone to any kind of theological seminary. I, I did have a mis uh, I did have a uh, uh, a mentor, uh, my father-in-law, who has uh, passed away uh, not too long ago. Um, but um, this is my first foray into the video process of going out and putting myself out here on uh, <laughs> on the internet, and uh, hopefully I can uh, contribute something uh, something good here. All right, that's very interesting. See, I just learned something new about you. I didn't know about you had your home church. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I had a, a a small home congregation meeting at my house for seven or eight years. So we usually had five or ten people, and maybe sometimes as many as twenty people. And um, to me, that's the model that I see in the scriptures. Uh, the the first churches uh, in the early church were all home churches, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it'd be wise to get back to that. Okay, now we have Brother Bill. Brother Bill, will you introduce yourself? Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name's William, and uh, I've been a believer for about uh, 30 years now. But uh, for nine years, I was an apostate. Uh, I was literally a living example of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 8, uh, Hebrews 10, verses 26, 27, John chapter 15, verses 2 and 6, and Luke chapter 8, verse 13. Um, I don't have a ministry, but uh, <clears throat> I'm the Lord chastened me after my nine long years of apostasy, and here I am today. Okay. All right. I'm glad you can join us. Um, I want to recap the, some of the main points that we discussed in the, in the last show. Um, first of all, um, probation versus salvation. What does that mean? Uh, Sister Lisa Harang came with, up with that when I was asking everybody to give me an idea, uh, I mean a, uh, a name for the program. Probation means that... Uh, uh, you're, when you get saved, you're really put on probation. You're not really saved, but if you if you behave well enough and, and you follow all the terms of the probation, then you, you may be saved uh, uh, eventually. Um, and that's what lordship salvation and work salvation really falls under. They put people in probation. And then salvation means that uh, the salvation is established and it's secure and we don't need to worry about it. We've received it and it's settled. Uh, I think this is probably Brother... Uh, uh, yeah, that's Brother Austin here. Let me take this call here. Hey, Brother Austin. Hey, Brother Luke. I didn't get the link. Oh, you didn't. Okay, I was wondering why you weren't here. Um, okay, I'm going to copy and paste and email the link to you. You should have received your email. Uh, the other two guys received it. Control C. Okay, let me send it to you, and it'll just take Austin a minute to receive it, and then uh, uh, click on and join us. Okay, I got it. This is Brother Austin Bell. He was with us last time, so I definitely need you here with me this time because uh, I'm going to I'm going to tread on uh, some ground that may be uh, problematic. Um, okay, let me see. Control B. Solid. 
solid SO. There it is. Okay, it's sent to you. So just click on and join us, okay? Okay, I got it. All right, so bye. Bye. All right. Okay, I'm glad that worked out. He can join us. I don't understand why he didn't get the link the same way you guys did, though. Okay, I'm going to wait for him to. Okay, there he is. There we go. Okay, you're up and running, Austin. Austin? Can't hear you. Hey, Brother Luke. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, good. Uh, I just introduced Brother Eric and Brother Bill, and joining us now is Brother Austin. And uh, uh, Austin, uh, they just took a moment and introduced themselves to the, to the world. And why don't you just tell a little bit about yourself, and then we'll continue with the topic. Okay, uh, my name is Austin Bell. Uh, I run a uh, it's an online Christ Ministries. It's like an evangelical group on uh, the internet. We do uh, we usually do soul winning on YouTube. If you guys are interested, uh, <clears throat> I changed my name. My name was in Hebrew. I changed it back to English. It's uh, just Austin Bell is the profile. Send me a message and we can go soul win. Uh, let's do this. Okay. All right. Very good. If we accomplish nothing else. At least we will enjoy fellowship among the saints today. Amen. Um, all right, uh, Austin. What I was just about to do was um, recap the first show. It was about two hours long, so there's a lot of material. But I want to recap a couple of the main points briefly, and then we'll pick up where we left off. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the the first question I asked, and that we have to try to uh, figure out is. Uh, are there contradictions in the Bible? Uh, on one hand, we have uh, verses that say you're saved by faith without works, and other hand, we have verses that say uh, that uh, you have you need faith and works. And uh, are these contradictions? Is there an explanation for that? How are we how are we to what are we to think of that? Can we conclude there's contradictions or there's explanations for these apparent contradictions? But the, the, the foundation I laid originally is, uh, uh, I, I say these are the ground rules for us understanding Scripture and, and, and formulating our beliefs. The foundation of our understanding must be established by the clear texts that require no interpretation, but, uh, not by the unclear, confusing, and controversial texts that do require interpretation. Does that make sense to everybody so far, that if you're going to formulate a doctrine, uh, isn't it make more sense to formulate it based on what is clear and doesn't require any interpretation? In other words, uh, you know, the sky is blue. No one needs to interpret that. We all know what that means. Uh, rather than something that is um, debated and argued about and controversial. You guys still there? I would yeah. Say I would agree. I would yes, say I, agree. I agree. I agree. So we we agree we agree with that point. And then the way that I tried to demonstrate it is the question: which is more reliable? trying to find the truth by solving a riddle or by hearing a simple declarative statement of the truth which always is more simplicity. reliable yeah always, always simplicity God is simple exactly. his word is simple he's not the author of confusion if it sounds confusing you just don't understand it clearly yes. yeah yeah so so far so far we've <laughs> we're all agreeing that um, it, it, it makes a lot more sense and it's a lot more reliable to put your uh, your faith in uh, on the verses that are clear cut instead of trying to put your faith in verses that are just it's like start trying to solve a riddle and we're going to try to solve the riddle on a number of these verses today and uh, but you certainly are, my my premise is that when you have clear verses don't put your faith in the verses that are confusing and that everybody's arguing over uh, now then the question is uh, is salvation attained by faith or by works, or by a combination of, of faith and works. And in the last episode, we clearly showed that it's, it is impossible for it to be a combination of faith and works. So we ruled that out. And then we, we asked the question, well, could it be entirely by works? And then we ruled that out by showing verse after verse that said, no works, no works, no works, no works. And then we cited probably about eight or ten clear verses that say it's only faith, only faith, only faith. 
So we've already now established that it cannot be a combination of faith and works. It is not works entirely, but it is completely faith. Faith in Jesus as our Savior is all that's required. So that's what we laid as a foundation. And then once we proved that point, then we were trying to take on uh, verses there are these controversial verses that people like to use to say, well, it's not really, what, how do you explain this verse then? And we took on a few of those verses already. Um, I think we, we got to uh, a couple of verses in James, uh, the demons believe and tremble, um, and uh, uh, do, you, do you recall, uh, Austin, a couple of the verses in James that we've already talked about? Uh, we mainly went over all the bo Oh, here's a newcomer. Oh, okay. Okay. Brother Joseph, hi. Brother Joseph, we want to say, want to speak? I think you're muted, Brother Joseph. Yeah. Brother Joseph, we can't hear you. I'm sorry, guys. The screen is completely different than what I'm used to. And I'm yeah, yeah but there you go. <laughs> you, you, you made it, you adapted quickly. Maybe this proves evol evolution. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Brother Joseph, uh, because you don't know everybody here, you know Brother Austin, uh, and we have Brother Eric here with us, and Brother Bill is the one that has the, uh, the icon with no picture on it. Well, he looks like he's the best looking guy here. Uh, uh, I'm ugly looking. You don't look ugly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now Brother, Brother Joseph, let me ask you, I, I don't remember, on the last episode of this particular topic, um, I don't think you were here because I think we discussed this on Fridays and you weren't around on Fridays, right? Yeah, okay, that's okay. right. Luke. So let me, let me uh, I, I've already done the introductions, I've already laid the premise for the show, and the, and the foundation, if you did not watch the first video, uh, Brother Joseph, I, I hope you go back and watch it because what we did in the first episode is we proved that salvation does not come by a combination of faith and works. We also Ooh. proved that salvation does not come by solely by works. And then we, we finally proved that salvation does come uh, by faith alone. And we, we went through the scriptures and proved that. Now I, I, I listened to it, Luke. Okay. So then, so then we started taking on some of these verses that I've over the years called problem texts. Uh, in other words, these are a real problem because people misunderstand them. They're controversial. They, everybody's dividing over what it really means. And uh, I laid the premise in the first show. I said, we should base our doctrine on the clear verses. If something is as clear, doesn't require any interpretation, everybody reads it one time, you know exactly what it means, let's base our faith in those verses and the verses that are everybody's arguing about what the meaning is, don't put your faith in those verses, they're too confusing. So now we're working our way through these uh, controversial verses and we covered a couple of verses in James. But uh, let me tell you what I'd like to do. Uh, first I'd like for everybody to just give me a, a, a very brief overview of what you think of the book of James. Uh, and, and then I'm going to tell you about my lengthy discussions with Brother Mitch over the last couple of years and that we talked a lot about this privately and now I want to tell everybody uh, what I think my conclusion is. But first, one at a time, just tell me briefly how you see the book of James as a, a, in general way. Uh, Austin, you going first? Sure, I'll go. I'm just making sure. Uh, I, one thing I noticed that a lot of people, a lot of believers notice today is, uh, regardless of the book, the, the entire Bible is used for correction, reproof, and instruction, but sometimes we take the message as it's literally displayed to us, and uh, that's not always the case. Sometimes when there's been a letter written, uh, it wasn't actually actually directed at you or your special beliefs like we know that in Galatians They started believing another gospel and Paul says oh foolish Galatians who has bewitched you We know that he's, he's directing the message to the Galatians. I think in the book of James. This is directed to a group that was uh, Could be very carnally minded or people that were ignoring others But I we really need to strongly look at that is maybe the message isn't directly taken to everybody. Now, it's absolutely, we can learn from it, and we can use it for instruction and reproof, but 
uh, sometimes we get too taken away as he's actually t directing the sole message as to us when we should really just kind of take it as an overview, look at it and say, well, <clears throat> we can see right here that this message is even directed towards us. And we just, you know, write it off and uh, move on from there. But, I, yeah, that's one thing on the book of James I just noticed is that sometimes in these confusing texts or parts, sometimes the message isn't even uh, directed uh, towards us. I have a verse I'll put on later on the show, and this will prove that. But uh, that's all I have for my part. Okay, very, very good point. Uh, I, I think what you've alluded to when you're talking about, he's talking about uh, correction or uh, exhorting, exhorting the people. It goes with the point that I made earlier that um, perhaps James is not speaking as an evangelist the way Paul is. Paul talks as an evangelist about how to get saved. James, is it possible James could be speaking as a pastor to people who are already saved and now he's working on trying to get them to grow and mature and do good works? Uh, I think that goes along with what you're saying. So that's one possible s scenario here. Uh, now, Brother Joseph, what is your overview of James? Oh, Brother uh, Joseph, Joseph. Getting used to this new screen. Uh, Luke, uh, you know, it's funny uh, that we're on this tonight because, I, I, as you know, I just asked you a question about uh, uh, some, uh, another pro problematic uh, verse uh, about Esau. And uh, <clears throat> Mitch just made a video. Uh, where he was talking about the canonization of scripture and uh, you know James uh, is a real problem for me I'll admit uh, it has been it's it's a it kinda gets its uh, fingers around my throat and drags me back to the legalism that I came from uh, you read it, and it it's not clear to me that it's directed to people other than us and if the scripture is for teaching, exhortation, and, uh, and uh, our profitable learning, uh, it confuses me more than teaches me, uh, I'm afraid, in, in many areas. So I, I admit that uh, I'm a little bit shallow on this book. Okay. Uh, you're not the first person. Uh, I confess, and most people I know have, over the years, dreaded the book of James. I've, I avoided it for many, many years because of the problems in it. Uh, but uh, eventually I got to the point where I dared to study it and over time I've come to various conclusions and my actually my conclusions have changed over, over time so but I do have a pretty strong opinion on it now and I'm going to share it last uh, okay brother Eric sure um, well I think uh, another thing that kind of happens is and uh, I agree with what was just said there um, and there were actually strong questions about uh, James being part of the canon um, in fact, I believe Martin Luther did not want to include it as part of the canon because of the apparent contradictions uh, uh, to what Paul uh, preached about faith. Um, he says specifically in the introduction to James that he's speaking to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, implying he's talking to Jews. Uh, it was one of the earliest, earliest books, I believe, of the New Testament written about 40 to 50 AD. So he was writing at a time where they were still possibly dealing with Christian Jews uh, who were uh, still dealing with the fact that they, they were deep into the law, still trying to break away from these arguments they were having about following law, Christians still following law. Um, he's not really, it doesn't seem like he's talking to Gentiles. Um, but, but in looking over it, I, I, th I think also you have to consider, like I said, who he's talking to and the context of certain comments that are made. Um, one of the errors I think people make in scripture is they assume that when you talk about justification, that it only means one thing throughout all scripture, and it doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, one may be testing, uh, talking about a certain justification while another is talking about a different, a justification before men or justification to God. Of course, justification to God being our, our salvation, uh, only being justified through Christ. Um, but to men, speaking of works, looking justified before men, um, uh, having works to show your faith or to show... Um, uh, to show you are a Christian, to bring more fruit, uh, to bring others to Christ. Um, so these are some of the complex issues that sometimes get into James. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting. Uh, uh, I have some videos that are quite old, and I have a video that's probably like at least six years old or more now, and it's called James versus Romans 6, I think. And I, I was trying to compare 
what James said as show me your faith, uh, and and God, what Paul said in, in uh, Romans where it says in God's sight we're justified by faith. So I was pointing out the fact that in God's sight He looks at a person's heart, and that's how He knows. You know, but in man's sight, according to James, he says, you've got to show me. I, I can't look into your heart, so all I can look at is your, your works. And I want to see your changed life. I want to see productivity. Uh, that's how I'm going to see if you're, there's a conversion or not. But I, uh, that's what I, how I argued in the past for this. So this is, to me, a, a good argument, and I'm, I've leaned against away from that now But I, because I don't think that a man has to prove his his salvation through his works, uh, and I think that uh, the people who are always pointing fingers uh, about trying to examine everybody else's lives and see if they're saved by their works, uh, this is a big mistake. It's a very slippery slope because no matter how much works I do, I can always find somebody who did more than me and said, "Luke, uh, whoa." I just don't see enough works in your life. You didn't leave your leave your family and go to India like I did, <laughs> you know. So we do we want to really go down that road where we're all pointing the fingers, comparing our works? So that's a that's a bad uh, way of, of uh, seeing it. But that's what it seems to see say in James. Okay. All right. Now, Bill. Yes. Last but last but not least, what's your overview of the book of James? Um. I agree with everything that uh, you guys just said about James. Um, I've got Zane Hodge's book um, on the book of James. I've, I've studied that recently, and uh, we're all on the same page okay. regarding James. Yeah. All right. Very good. Uh, okay. A couple of points here. Um, the... And it's one thing on, uh, on works, Brother Bill is going to put out there. It seems that uh, works are held differently to each other's doctrine. I know the Catholics see works as the charity, the do good tidings, all this stuff, but the lordship crowd with works see it as uh, you must stop sinning. So I'm, uh, there's even a different view on uh, on works even for that for that matter of fact because you have different people that hold works as uh, meaning different things. Usually yeah. traditional large-scale religions, Mormons, Catholics, the <clears throat> Jehovah's Witnesses, they usually hold to, you know, you must do charitable works or give to the poor, but the lordship crowd, the single mans, the pipers, Arthurs, and, and washers, they usually hold to, you know, must endure in the faith and uh, work to stop sinning, work your holiness. So, I mean, there's even a difference in works in that matter. Yeah, the, the lordship crowd tends to see uh, works as a prerequisite, ongoing, lifelong prerequisite to... Uh, uh, prelude to salvation. Yeah. Right. Okay, I think everybody did a real good job so far presenting various ways of seeing the book of James. And already we can see right <laughs> that uh, there's a lot of different ways of looking at the book. One thing that nobody mentioned, uh, but I think it was Eric that alluded to it when he said that it says right in the beginning he's written it to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. And for that reason, there's a group of people called, uh, well, they don't like to be called this, but, but I, I don't mind calling them this. They're called, I call them hyper-dispensationalists. Uh, I actually uh, coined another term uh, that makes it even more specific, and I call them paul onlyists, And they believe that uh, only Paul's writings are for the church, and that everything before and after Paul in the, in the scriptures is not really, uh, uh, we can learn from it, but it's not really really to us. And so the hyper D would say the book of James is written to the 12 tribes of Israel. It's clear as day. It's right there in the scriptures. It's written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. So why are we being concerned about it? Uh, so that's, uh, that's one way, and that's a real easy way of solving the problem. Just We might as well just tear it out and say throw it away. And it also goes along with uh, someone mentioned, I think it was Eric also. Eric, you, you're... You're getting a lot of check marks on the list here. Things here. Uh, you also mentioned that the idea that Martin Luther, and not only Martin Luther but uh, others, uh, when the canon was formed, uh, there was great arguments over whether James should be in the scripture. Martin Luther inserted a, a divider uh, separating James because he questioned its uh, canonicity because of the clear what he what he called the clear contradictions to faith alone. So uh, at least Martin Luther concluded that these really are contradictions. 
so the, the Hyperides have an easy answer. Um, Brother Mitch, uh, when I first started talking to him a few years ago, uh, he was basically, I got the impression from him, he thought it should just be torn out and thrown away because he was agreed with Martin Luther's viewpoint on this. Uh, since then, Mitch and I have had uh, probably, uh, you know, 20 or 40 hours of privately discussing this, and he's really won me over to a couple of things on this. But rather than trying to give you a, a presentation on it, uh, I want to uh, let go through some scriptures and ask you guys and see if you can come to the same conclusion as I go through these scriptures. So let's let's start here. Uh, First of all, Acts 10. I'm not going to read scriptures. I'm going to give you a synopsis of Acts 10. Remember when Peter had the vision and uh, uh, he was told to eat these things that he uh, was forbidden in Judaism and he said it's unclean and, and the Lord told him, no, nothing's unclean to eat it. And then after the vision, Cornelius had also had a visitation from an angel and the angel said that, uh, this guy Peter, he needed to talk to him. He had an important message for him. And so Cornelius uh, goes and seeks out uh, uh, Peter. <clears throat> and Peter talks to uh, Cornelius and, and realizes that uh, God uh, asked him to give the message of salvation to the Gentiles. And that once he did, Cornelius and the entire group of Gentiles with him, they all got saved. And the proof, the evidence at that time, was the filling of the Holy Spirit and the speaking in tongues. So Peter was convinced at this point that God has called him, contrary to what everybody says, that Paul was the first apostle for the Gentiles. Peter was the first apostle to the Gentiles. This is the first time the message of salvation was given to the Gentiles. The Gentiles got saved in Acts 10. Okay. Now, uh, first of all, before I go on, uh, is anybody... I uh, want to comment on anything I said about that, if there's any mistake I've made there. Uh, one thing, Brother Luke, if not what you said, just uh, something I noticed. I, I looked into a little bit, and I'm not exactly a teacher on the matter, but, but regarding uh, Martin Luther, a yeah. lot of people don't hold him as a true teacher in the regards that he taught baptismal re uh, regeneration as a salvation requirement. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. Well, I should let you finish talking. Go ahead. Say, more, say the whole thing about Martin Luther, then I'll answer. Just, just the fact that he, he believed in a type of bap baptismal regeneration and the fact that he didn't agree with the book of Revelation in the sense of he said he didn't understand it or something and it should be uh, taken out of the scriptures, but I just noticed that uh, the webmaster of Jesus is Savior, uh, David J. Stewart, he holds to the fact that he's not for Luther and the fact that he's taught uh, heresy regarding the salvation with baptismal regeneration. Yeah, but my, that's all true, everything you said, but my question is, um, are the, the Jehovah Witnesses 100% wrong, or are they partially right? Are the Mormons 100% wrong? So you can have, you, or, or even uh, David J. Stewart, uh, or even Sin City Preacher. Uh, I don't know anybody who is 100% right, but that doesn't mean that because we can see they're clearly wrong on one thing, that everything else they say is, is, is tainted and, and, and error. So it is possible to learn something from Martin Luther, even though the, your charges against him, I, I've heard, and I think that those are legitimate charges from what I've heard. Okay, oh, but does that, absolutely. Yeah. That, I, that, I'm not against him. I just, I just that's something I would want. I wanted to point out to people. Just to, yeah, that's a, that's a good thing. I'm glad you pointed out. It's important for everybody to know. But that doesn't mean that we cannot learn something from Martin Luther just because he was wrong about some things. Exactly. Okay. Uh, so my question is the my uh, recant, I mean recount of Acts 10 that I just gave. Uh, does everybody think that's accurate, and uh, you want to expound upon that before we go on? Well, I I do want to uh, input that I I think it's a wonderful thing that uh, that. Uh, Oh, never mind. I, I disregard. I'm a little goofy today. I'm, I've been rushing all day. I was going to say something, and I just reconsidered it. Sorry. Okay. I want to ask you, Brother Joseph, see this? Yes, sir. You see this? Okay. 
not only Joseph, but everybody. You have a pen and paper, and when someone's talking, if an idea comes to mind, just write and make a little note to yourself. Otherwise, you'll forget. In, jo in Joseph's case, he did not forget. He just reconsidered. <laughs> that thought, is true. He thought better. He thought better of it. Brother Joseph, uh, you have also uh, you have a hundred uh, interesting questions that I love to talk about, but you have to always guard against taking off on, on going off in some rabbit hole on a wild goose chase. That's just what I did. I decided not to jump down the hole. <laughs> okay. So, uh, anybody else want to comment on Acts chapter ten before I move on to the next point? Okay. Now we have in uh, Acts. Oh, oh, clicked on the wrong one here. In Acts 11, we have Peter uh, in Jerusalem, in the local church in Jerusalem, and Peter recounts this entire event that I just explained in Act 10. He recounts the entire thing, and uh, let's start. Let's read this uh, verse here, uh, verse 11. Peter saying, For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? Okay, before I go on, let's just discuss that one verse there. Uh, I'm going to emphasize a couple of points. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? Okay, so let's uh, throw that out there, whoever wants to comment on that. Sounds like uh, some people could jump on that with a little predestination Calvinist talk. I didn't get any Calvinism out of it, but... Uh, uh, I got, got uh, Where he couldn't resist the gift. It sounds like irresistible grace, the, the, one of the Calvinistic points to me. Um, okay, first of all, then let me ask you this. It says, for as much then as God gave them the like gift. You have to understand what this word gift in this case is referring to. What is the gift? Because I think you're jumping to the wrong conclusion here. What, what I, I'd like to just kind of inject something possibly because it was Peter was the one uh, Paul took issue with uh, for uh, he would um, he would sit with Gentiles eat with Gentiles and then when the Jews would come Peter would uh, act differently he would uh, he, he would go sit with the Jews and he would stay away from the Gentiles brother um, Eric yes. brother Eric can I ask you to hold that because I want to discuss that in about 10 minutes sure absolutely see I have an advantage over you I have an outline. <laughs> I'm, I put together an outline of where I want to go. <laughs> and you, jump, you just jumped 10 minutes ahead. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, Luke, Luke, regarding what you were asking, uh, the reason I threw that out there was not to go down a rabbit hole, but uh, I was just watching a sermon that you had referred to me. And the gift, uh, the irresistible gift, is not faith, but rather the object of the faith. And uh, the Calvinists see the faith as the gift. Yeah, and yeah. so they would say, listen, we didn't have a free choice. We were predetermined. And uh, actually, it's the uh, object of the faith that is the gift. Now, if I, brother, if, if I had read the whole entire thing instead of just pulling this one verse, I don't think you would have jumped to that conclusion. Because in this case, the gift is not talking about salvation. The gift is the filling of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. Oh, you're right. I was lost. I did not, see, I see. Did not uh, look before or after. So in other words, Peter is saying, he's recounting chapter 10, this experience he had with Cornelius. He, he preached the message of salvation to Cornelius and his people. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. That was the sign. And Peter's recounting it and saying, God gave them the same gift he gave us, and that's the sign of the filling with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Okay. So it has nothing to do with predestination or whether salvation is a gift or faith is a gift. Or, that's a totally different uh, area. Okay? Uh, okay, uh, so the gift that Peter's referring to here is uh, the filling with the Holy Spirit. So well, I'll read this again. For as much then as God gave them the like gift. In other words, the like gift is, remember the gift we got at Pentecost, how we were given the Holy Spirit? Okay? He gave it to the Gentiles too. And then he, then he goes on to say, 
who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's significant about that? Don't be shy. Come on. I'm scared. To, I'm scared to say anything, Luke. I've been roaming around in the outfield with my catcher's mask up. Don't be. Don't be scared. Come on. You're not. You're not getting any kind of like put in the corner if you're wrong. And you I know. Plus, uh, I apologize, Luke. I was uh, looking up a verse I was going to put over here. Uh, could you give me the verse again, real fast, Luke? I'm sorry, I wasn't with it. Oh man. Okay. Okay, this is Acts 11, I think. It's chapter, verse 17. I'm going to read the whole thing one more time. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us. Peter's talking about God gave Cornelius and then the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then he says, who, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? Now, it says, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh Come on, guys. Uh, you've heard that before, haven't you? Oh, absolutely. Uh, imputed righteousness. He believed and he was saved. He was saved. Uh, for then as much as God gave them the, like the gift, it also reminds me of uh, Romans 5.15, the free gift. Uh, to, okay. Uh, you know, well, we already discussed that, uh, Austin, while you were off studying some other scripture while we were talking, uh, we already discussed that this gift is not talking about salvation in this case. This gift is the filling of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Oh, okay. In this con in this context, the gift is the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. So God filled Cornelius and his group with the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues, so Peter would know. Wait a second. That's the same thing that happened to all us Jews at Pentecost. And now I saw with my own eyes the Gentiles are Doing the filled with the Holy thing. Spirit and speaking in tongues. He God gave them this gift just like He gave to us. Okay. So now let's let's make sure let's, let's settle that point. And I'm now I'm asking you, what about this phrase that Peter says? Uh, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Don't is, does anybody see the significance of that besides me? Who, the only who, people to, the only okay. people to get the gift is to someone who believed on Jesus. Okay, uh, first of all, who's talking? We've got Peter. This is not Paul, right? Right. Yeah. We're Peter's talking. But Paul is the one that said, uh, the answer, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Paul, Peter, is he tell, said exactly the mm -hmm. same P Peter message. Peter was justifying what Paul, Paul said. He was, yeah, right, he was justifying what Paul said. He simply believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't do anything extra. All they did was believe. He was not justifying what Paul said. I mean, he was he Peter was said it Paul first. Said. He, was, he was, oh, would this be, well, the timing of this is... This is this is this is the first people to be preached to the Gentiles. This is probably before Paul even got saved and came on the scene. Luke, I am so slow, but now I see the experience yeah, yeah, here. I see, I see. Uh, oh, every, everyone, keep, everybody, keep, everything. <laughs> every everybody keeps saying Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, but it it, uh, it just now got hit into my head that Peter was there first and also an apostle to the Gentiles. Yeah, okay, so that's one thing I want everybody to get this light come on. Say, look, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, but before Paul became the apostle to the Gentiles, Peter was called first to go speak to Cornelius and present the message to the, uh, to the Gentiles. Now, Peter said the message he, he, sent, he said to them was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Peter, and now people like, accuse Peter of preaching a different message. But right here, Peter says, that's what they did. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they got filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay, so that's the first thing. Now let's go to... Um, and, and also, look at the end of it. Let me ask you to comment on this part. And he, then Peter says, what was I that I could withstand God? In other words, here he is, think, shocked, amazed, that the Gentiles also received the gift of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, because they believed on Jesus. And he said, how can I, well, am I supposed to stand against God? God g gave them the gift too. So, uh, 
why would he say, what was I that I could withstand God? What in, possibly could make him say that to this group he's speaking to? Remember, he's in Jerusalem talking to the Jerusalem church. Right. This is a little bit of what I was kind of alluding to before, which is I think he was kind of, he, at that point, he kind of it didn't accept the fact that they had the same sort of rights and to the privileges, the things that, that, uh, that they did. He didn't, he didn't believe the Gentiles had the rights of those yeah. sorts of things. Yeah. Brother, in your opening statement, when I asked everybody to kind of uh, encapsulate James, uh, you alluded to many of the things I'm going to be going through here. So you, you got a little head start on us all. So uh, I know that you're going to really uh, see how this is all reinforcing your point of view. Okay. Now, uh, but can, so anybody else want to say anything about that before I move to the next verse? Peter is acting like he's amazed and he's defending himself to these, these uh, people in Jerusalem. He said, he said, what was I supposed to do? Am I supposed to stand against God and say, no, don't give it to the Gentiles? You well, see what's think, going on? Well, yeah, and I think it confirms you. You go further to the next verse, you hear what they say. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying that hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Wait this, a second. Uh, That's the verse I was going to read next, brother. <laughs> there he goes again. You see what he's doing? He's jumping ahead of me every time. Uh, okay, so let's read that verse. Quiet. <laughs> no, no, it, it, you're right on target. So the next verse says, when they heard these things. Now, when they, who's they? The other Jews he was speaking to. The church in Jerusalem. Church in Jerusalem. Now, who's, who are the members of the church in Jerusalem? Well, I mean, the, the Jews and the Gentiles. Right? No, there's no Gentiles. There's no Gentiles in the Jerusalem church. Right, but they're saved Jews. I didn't know that, Luke. They're all Jews in Jerusalem, they're not one Jews. Gentile. They're all Jews. And Peter is amazed that the Gentiles, Cornelius and his friends and family, that they got saved. They're in shock. They can't hardly believe it. He says, what was I supposed to do? God saved them too. I don't, I, it's not my fault. <laughs> you see? And so now he's back in Jerusalem talking to the Jews who are now uh, believing in Jesus, thinking it's only for the Jews. And he's saying, what was I supposed to do? He, God did it. I can't stand against God. And then, so he's talking to these people, and he says, when they heard these things, they, meaning these Jews, Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, and who's the leader of the group in Jerusalem, by the way? Who's the leader of the Jerusalem church? The Jerusalem church, I believe it's James. James. James is the leader of the Jerusalem church from beginning to end, okay? Then, then, so when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So here they all finally concede, okay, now we, we, have to, we have to admit God's given the Gentiles the same thing we have. Okay? Luke, uh, James was the leader of the Jerusalem church. From the very beginning till uh, all the way through James' life, he was the leader of the Jerusalem church. And he's the author of the book of James? Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Okay. You're going to be more fascinated. In about an hour, you're going to be like, be like jumping up in the air. <laughs> okay, so let's go now. Okay, before I go on, Anybody have any kind of like uh, light they want to shed on what we covered up to this point with uh, the Peter preaching to the G Gentiles, the Gentiles getting saved, uh, him being shocked, him going to Jerusalem, talking to the Jewish uh, believers uh, and, and telling them about this experience and then them all saying, wow, I guess a God, I, we have to admit, God's given salvation to the Gentiles too. So before I go on, uh, everybody have a, has a chance to comment on that so far. Well, I just want to say that the light's all coming my way. I don't have a lot to throw back. Uh, I think it's absolutely fascinating. I guess I, except for knowing that James was uh, the in charge of the Jerusalem church, I, I knew this, but I didn't put it together the way you're doing here, and it's uh, very enlightening for me. Okay. All right, then let's go on now. The next verse I have, we're, now we're moving up to Acts 15. We're going to restart with verse 1. And it says, Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch. 
and we're teaching the believers, quote, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved, unquote. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Okay, what, what is significant so far? You don't have to, uh, most people, don't, don't, people can't raise their hand. I can't see hands going up. So everybody just uh, take your liberty and just start. Whoever talks first can speak. Well, we, we, we can see at the beginning of, um, of the chapter here that the, one of the first things they're starting to do is they're trying to bring people right under the law after, uh, after salvation has been applied. They're trying to bring them back to saying you must be circumcised, you must fall under, under, all, under, uh, under all these laws of Moses, or else your salvation is not real. They were trying to immediately bring them under the law. Okay, uh, but who are these people who are doing what you said? Who are they? Wasn't wasn't there a group of uh, people going about uh, spreading the false gospel of works uh, at that time? Um, well, uh, that's something that I'll, we'll discuss later. But my point is, this particular group of people, these are Jewish believers. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Jewish believers are telling Paul that the Gentile believers that he's been converting have to get circumcised. Now, what is circumcision? It was a Jewish thing, right? right. It's right. part of Judaism. Right. So what do you conclude so far that these Jews, who now are Jewish believers in Christ, and they're telling the, the Gentiles they got to get circumcised too. So what? what's your impression of that? Well, they're trying to place uh, the new believers under the uh, Jewish law. Yeah, they're trying to put them under Judaism. Right. Okay. All right. Um, so the important thing is, says they came down from Judea. So these are these are Jews. They came to Antioch, and it says uh, they said they had to be circumcised or they cannot be saved. Okay. So this is a work, circumcision, water baptism, or any other else that they they uh, add as a work. Uh, we know that that's not the message of salvation. It's faith alone, not faith plus works. So this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to where? To Jerusalem. Jerusalem. This is very important to keep this in mind. They're going to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Now, who are the apostles and elders in Jerusalem? Well, I guess you, you said it was James, J uh, James. and Peter. It's, it's James, and they're all Jews. There's no Gentiles except the ones that got saved with, with Cornelius and his group and whoever else has uh, been uh, uh, converted from the Gentiles. Uh, and then, uh, then what Paul and, and Barnabas had been doing off in on their ministry. So then they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. So they're glad the Gentiles are being becoming believers now, but they're trying to impose circumcision on them. So they came to Jerusalem. They're welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Now let's look at verse 5. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Okay, let me uh, first emphasize this. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. Pharisees. Okay, so tell me. Why is that important to understand? Well, number one, it seems like some of the Pharisees uh, have uh, come over to the side of Christ uh, with wrong impressions with it, but uh, uh, they were the ones who crucified the Lord or had him crucified. Mm -hmm. 
Let me ask, is, are, are Bill and Austin still on board with us? Yes, uh, I'm still here. Yes, Bill. I'm here. I, oh, I apologize. Okay. All right, you guys are you're uh, you're either very good listeners or some, something. I don't know, but uh, don't be shy about putting in your two cents. Okay, so the important thing I want everybody to get here at this point is that these people, it says, some of the believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, these were the most religious, dogmatic, legalistic of all the Jews. And they it says they were believers. So in the beginning of the church, we have people who are very legalistic Jews, and they become believers in Jesus. But apparently what's happened here is they're saying they've got to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. So what conclusion do you make about these people? My conclusion is they were the uh, originators of the works, lordship salvation, the works-based uh, salvation to maintain your salvation. You have to have good works. Yeah, that <laughs> you're exactly right. MacArthur, P Piper, and Washer what could be right there with them. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, and who else is there with them? The leader, James. James is the leader of the Jerusalem Church. That's where all these people are coming from who are trying to impose these things on these Gentiles. Okay. Now, why are they trying to impose them on the Gentiles? <clears throat> Because they believe they are still under Judaism. They, they believe that they must still practice Judaism. Lou, and I've got a question here. Yes. yes. They, they were the, the uh, MacArthur's of their day then. Uh, but here's the big question in my mind. Uh, are, are they actual Christians? Are they actually saved? if they're mixing the law with the uh, gospel. Well, that's something we've discussed many times before, brother, and uh, that's something everybody's going to have to try to guess on your uh, based upon your own uh, you know, uh, understanding of everything. Uh, if they ever put their faith in Jesus completely and not uh, Jesus plus Judaism, I would say they got saved. But if they ever if they thought from the very beginning that that it was Judaism, following Judaism, and believing in Jesus, then I challenge whether they got saved. Because this is what Paul was arguing about. I'm jumping ahead again. We're going to get way, getting way ahead of where I'm going with this. Okay, But whether they're really Christians, I don't, I'm don't. i not going to say. But they are trying to impose these, this Judaism, circumcision and keeping the law of Moses, they're trying to impose it on the Gentiles. Okay? Now... But they were Pharisees, and they were believers, okay? Now, let's go to verse 6. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. Uh, after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Quote, Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God knows the heart. Showed, God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, no. We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved, just as they are. That's Peter talking. Does that sound like um, uh, Peter was preaching a different message than Paul, or the same at that point? The same. Same. Sounds the same to me. Yep. And this is long before Paul came along with his mystery. The people say, oh, it's a mystery that Paul got this this message. Nobody else had it. I uh, wanted to touch on the yoke. Uh, I want to apologize. I was getting my uh, scriptures together, Brother Luke. Uh, okay. The, were we still going to do problematic scriptures? Yeah, we are, but but we're, uh, until we get this book of James settled, 
We're not going to discuss because the, the way I'm look the way I'm looking at this, brother, is we could go through one verse at a time in James, and let's say there's ten or twelve verses that are problematic. We could go through that one at a time and try to resolve them, or we could try to resolve the whole book of James at one time and maybe okay. solve it all all in that way. Okay. That's that's fine. Uh, on the on the on the yoke. Uh, Jesus said in uh, Matthew 11, uh, this is his whole sermon, 28 through 30, uh, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if people say, well, that sounds too easy. Well, Jesus said his yoke is easy. All we have to do is believe. Yeah. Believe. Once we believe he's our Savior, we get yoked to him. He's in us. We're in him. We're yoked to him, and uh, that'll, that'll never change. And then the burden is light because uh, we don't have to do anything about what we choose to do through, by following the promptings of the Holy Spirit will determine how much we grow and mature and, and, and produce good fruit and good and treasures in heaven. Okay, now that's another area that we, uh, I don't want to go off on that right now, but right here it says Peter is telling him, he's standing up to these people. Peter is standing up to them and saying, look, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. Okay, so Peter is defending the real message of salvation, and he's standing up to these uh, religious Jewish believers who are trying to impose Judaism now upon the Gentiles. Because these Jewish believers never left Judaism. They stayed as uh, Judaizers who say they believe in Jesus, and yet they're still following Judaism. Okay, now let's go to verse 20. There, there's something real quick I wanted to add there, Brother Lucas. Yeah. Just going, kind of going through this, just kind of came to me. You almost wonder if uh, upon hearing that the uh, um, these Gentiles had received similar gifts that they uh, from the Holy Spirit, you almost wonder if there was maybe some sort of a jealousy thing going on there because maybe they weren't receiving certain gifts the Gentiles were showing to have because they were still kind of stuck in a rut of trying to work their way to an uh, approving – uh, status. They believe well, we got to make sure we're going by the law as to where the Gentiles were simply believing, trusting completely, and receiving gifts of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I wonder if that might have been going on. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. I, who knows what their motivation was, uh, but there's a, there's a big schism. You can see the beginning of the schism here, Brother Joseph. Okay. Well, they, were, they were still under a theocratic state at that time, Brother Luke. And uh, being under the theocratic state of Israel, uh, they were, I believe, probably bound by by their traditions, uh, not not the uh, rabbinic uh, traditions, but the mosaic traditions. Uh, and so that they may have had some substance there. Well, pretty soon you're going to find out how bad this really gets. Okay, uh, let's go on. It says, uh, verse 20, uh, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. So this is the Jewish, uh, the, the uh, Jerusalem church led by James with a lot of Pharisee believers in it. And they say, okay, Paul says, don't impose on them any burdens like the following the law or circumcision. We're saved by grace. Uh, and uh, and then uh, the conclusion of the, the Jerusalem church is they say, okay, let's write the, them a letter saying that they, they, they should abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from strangled things and from blood. They didn't mention the, in, the initial problem. They didn't say they had to be circumcised or follow the laws of Moses, but they said they had to do these things. So what are we to think of that? I'm reminded of uh, what Paul said, uh, to him who it is sin, it is sin, and to him who it isn't, it isn't. Or maybe that was Peter, I'm not sure. But uh, maybe to the uh, rabbinical uh, people there, uh, they it was sin, sinful, uh, and, and not to the Gentiles. 
Okay. All right, let me go on. So, so in other words, this is like a compromise in politics. Okay? Uh, they're saying they've got to be circumcised and follow all the laws of Moses. Peter says, no, they don't. They're saved by grace. And then they end up saying, okay, we'll compromise. They don't have to follow the laws of Moses, and they don't have to be circumcised, but we're going to impose this on them. Okay? Pollute no idols, fornication, strangle things, see? So they compromise, and they still put some kind of legalism on them, but not full Judaism. That's for these Gentiles, okay? Now let's go to verse 24. It says, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such command. Okay? Uh, so, in other words, uh, who's talking and who's who's this intended for, this verse here? I hear a whistle. Is there a whistle going on? Yeah, it's not me. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. My wife's in the back boiling some water. <laughs> sorry. I think he's talking uh, to the ones that are that are uh, pushing the uh, the law on the Gentiles, right, Peter? No, he says uh, that certain which went out from us have troubled you. He's talking to the Gentile believers, right. and he's saying some of the Jewish believers from Jerusalem, we realize they've gone to you and troubled you, subverting your soul, saying you must be circumcised. So this is uh, Peter or Paul or somebody or a letter that is saying, uh, letting the Gentiles know, no, you don't have to keep the Jewish law. Uh, and, and it says, no, you don't have to keep the law. We gave no such commandment. You don't have to keep the Jewish law. Okay? Right. Okay, so now we have, we've reached the point now where we've got, you can see the beginnings of the, the dispute. These Jews, Jerusalem, uh, these these Jews who b became believers, are still holding on to Judaism, and now they're trying to impose the Judaism on the Gentile believers, and now they say, okay, no, the Gentiles don't have to follow the law, so they finally concede that. Okay, but what happens next? Acts twenty-one, verse twenty. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. <laughs> they have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to their uh, our customs. And then verse 28 crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law. So who's talking to who and what's being said there? Real fast, Brother Luke? Yeah. Uh, where exactly are we in Acts? I want to follow along with you. 21-28. Uh, so Acts. Chapter 21, verses 20, 21, and then 28. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Okay. So, what, what do you get from that? Who's talking? Who are they talking to? And what's the problem? Isn't it a reference to Jesus? What the, what the context of this scripture is about? No, it's not having anything to do with Jesus. The Jews were saying Paul is the bad guy, right? The the Jewish believers, these are Jewish believers right now, guys. This is very important for us to get. These are not just Jews, the nomadic uh, Jewish Christians. These are Jewish believers, the same people we've been discussing all along. Right. Okay? Let me read it again. And they, they brought in verse 18, they bring, uh, the following day Paul went in with us unto James. So they're bringing him before James and then kind of holding him uh, against the things that he's saying. 
Yeah, I should have included that part. Thank you for adding that. Oh, so no Paul, Paul is kind of being put on trial between before these Jewish believers, and they're saying, uh, said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed? So these are Jewish believers, and he's saying, Paul, look, look at all the Jews that are believers now. But all of them are zealous for the law. Mm -hmm. So what is your conclusion about that statement? They're, they're trying to prove that their way is better than Paul's way. They're trying to say, well, by us telling them to go with the law, they, they love it. They, they want to be under the law. They welcome this. They, uh, you're, you're here you're telling them that they're not under the law, but we think they should be, and they're kind of holding it all over his head. As if they're, as if they're, the point is, the point is, they're, they're, they're accusing Paul now of not telling Gentiles that they don't have to follow the law. That's already been settled, right? Remember what we discussed just before? They right. conceded the Gentiles don't have to follow the law. Right, okay? but these are Jewish believers that, that they're talking. But now about. these are Jewish believers in right. Jerusalem with James, telling Paul, "How dare you go out and tell the new Jewish believers right. elsewhere they don't have to follow the law?" So they're, they're saying, the Gentile believers don't have to follow the law, but you, you, you better not tell the Jewish leaders, Jewish believers, they don't have to, yeah, they still have to follow the law. You see what's going on? You see that there's a large group of Jewish believers uh, in the beginnings of the church that never left Judaism. And they think they still have to follow law. They want to impose it on everybody else, and they have never embraced Jesus to save them. They still are saying, "Oh yeah, Jesus is the Savior, but we've got to follow all these laws too." And I think I, I see where you're going with this now. I put I put this. It fell right into place because now you're going. Um, you're bringing together what I originally said a little earlier, which you talked about as far as the originator of Paul's uh, of James's letter of who he's talking to, and what they're talking about. At that point, he's writing a letter where he's still engaging. In things that he's really maybe not supposed to be engaging. Yeah, in. yeah, you're, uh, you're, uh, you were in your in original statement, and now you're right on track. But you're jumping ahead of me again because I'm not ready. I'm not ready I'll to stop. tie it all together yet. Okay. I'll stop. But but right here, can you see what's important? What's being said? Mm -hmm. These people, he Paul is in front of James and the Jewish believers in Jerusalem, and they're accusing Paul, and they're saying. Look how many Jews are believers now, and but we all still follow the law. But right. you, well, you, Paul, you're out there telling other Jewish believers they don't have to follow the law. And then at verse 28 it says, this is the man that teaches all been everywhere against the people and the law. So they're really coming down on Paul. And what ultimately happens, uh, I'm not going to go into that, I didn't, I didn't uh, save those verses, but we know what happens with Paul at that point. Can anybody say what happens with these people and Paul? Paul has to flee for his life. Right. They have a group of Jewish believers that take an oath they're not going to eat until Paul's dead. Mm -hmm. And why? Because Paul is telling Jewish believers in Jesus that they don't have to follow the law. Judaism is over. You don't need to do that. You shouldn't do it. Okay? Are so we, that's what's happened. To... Yes, Austin. Sorry, Brother Luke. I, I'm just, are we trying to establish the law is, is over? Because I have a verse that just would throw it all out together, uh, Romans 10.4, for Christ no. is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Brother, brother I'm, what I'm trying to do is once and for all, explain what the book of James is really all about. Mm -hmm. Because if we understand what's really happening in James, then we no longer have to be, be in a position of, of just uh, trying to twist ourselves like a pretzel, trying to make all the verses it. in James work when they can't work because the message in James is not our message. Okay, That's what I'm trying to lead to. Okay, so yeah, we don't need that one verse, uh, Austin, because we've I cited many verses last episode that say no law, no law, no works, no works. We know that, but I'm trying to show you what's happening in the book of James, and it started in the book of Acts in the very beginning of the church. So it's the same thing. Okay, uh, so now let's move on. Now we're going to move up to Galatians 2, verse 11. 
when but then but when Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him face to uh, to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that, certain came from James. He did he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, who's talking, and what who's he uh, what's he talking about here? Well, Paul, I think, wrote the book of Galatians, so he must have been talking about uh, James getting the heck out of Dodge. Okay. About... Go ahead, Eric. No, I was going to I was gonna um, say he's talking about the things that uh, Peter was suffering under James's leadership in the church. Yeah. Yeah, okay, let's read it again. I'll think about this. Verse 11. But when Paul is saying, when Peter came from Antioch, I withstood him to the face. Paul stood right up to Peter and blamed Peter and said to him, he, he said, B before uh, that certain uh, the group of people came from James. Came from James? Why is that important to understand? Because this, this is the whole book we're trying to reason with, try and keep in, to keep in, in sync with, uh, with everything else we're trying to talk about as far as our faith not being justified by works. Yeah, um, this is this is James, the uh, leader of the Jerusalem Church, and we've already established that the Jerusalem Church is still Judaism. Mm -hmm. And James, had, 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 look what James has done so far, and now now Paul's given another example of the problem that James and the Jerusalem Church is creating, and he says that when the people came from James and Jerusalem Church. He said, Peter, uh, he, he was eating with the Gentiles. He was eating Gentile food. But when James' people came, Peter wouldn't do it anymore. He was afraid, said, fearing them which were of the circumcision. He was afraid of the Jewish believers. Mm -hmm. And get it back to James, that James. Peter, oh, Peter's not following Judaism. Peter's uh, uh, eating with the Gentiles, Gentile food. Mm -hmm. And then verse 13, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, in so much that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So these Jewish believers came from James in Jerusalem, and when they came to, to uh, uh, Antioch, uh, Peter uh, stopped eating with the Gentiles, and even Barnabas was afraid, so he joined eating with the, the, the Jews, and he no longer would eat with the Gentiles uh, and, because they were afraid of the Jewish believers from Jerusalem. Now we go to verse 14. But when I saw that they walked out not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. In other words, what's the truth of the gospel? And, and regarding eating and, and the Gentiles and Judaism. The truth of the gospel in reference here is... The gospel says we're saved by faith. We don't have to follow the Judaism laws about eating. Okay, and yet Peter's doing it because the Jews from Jewish believers from James and Jerusalem are there, so he's going to do it because he doesn't want to get the backlash from them. Okay, uh, so now, now he says, uh, "I said unto Peter before them all." Paul is saying this. I stood right up to Peter's face. I said, "If you, being a Jew, live after the manner of Gentiles." and not as do the Jews. So he's saying, Peter, you know that you're living like a Gentile. You're not following the Jewish laws. Why are you compelling the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Luke, uh, can I ask a question? I, I don't know if it's just pertinent to me, but it was the people from James, was James mistaken as to the... Uh, simplicity of the gospel, or was it just people from James? Just that's, that's, that's something at the end of the show today, I'm going to ask you to answer. Okay? <laughs> okay, you, all right. That's the whole point. I want to present this, and then you have to decide what all this means. Okay? I prefer it when you tell me what it means. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're in Galatians 2, and, and, and Paul is talking about how he stood up 
to, to Peter because Peter was being a hypocrite. He was not following Judaism, but when, when James sent the Jewish believers from Jerusalem to visit them, all P Peter was following Judaism then, and he stood up to him and said, you know you're not following Judaism, and, and why are you asking the Gentiles to live like Jews, and you don't live like a, a gen when you live like a Gentile? Now, verse 16, knowing that a man, now this is all part of the same thing. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And then verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Okay, so before I go on to the book of Hebrews now, what can we conclude so far? Who wants to kind of bring sum up everything so far? Well, so what we've got this happen so far is um, James, as the head of the church in Jerusalem, was uh, had uh, he and the other believers there as Jewish believers were trying to bring. Uh, the Jews there under the law and faith. They were trying to. They were trying to do both, and as a result, it was affecting how uh, Peter would act. You know, Peter would come and possibly, and, and some of the other uh, disciples how they were acting. It would cause them to feel compelled to act a certain way to avoid. And he, I mean, it even got to the point Paul says where they they were threatening uh, harm upon him. I mean, it got to the point where I'm sure Peter felt the same thing, which is why he. Uh, began to do the things he did. He didn't want to suffer possible uh, <laughs> physical uh, repercussions uh, or, or displeasing those who were in the Jerusalem church. Uh, so he started to kind of cater to these ways and started to agree and say, well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to go ahead and show as if I believe that that's, that's true too, and I'm going to go ahead and follow the laws. And, uh, and it, it sets, set this bad example for everyone. Okay, very good. Uh, unless someone wants to give a recap, I'll recap what we've got, what we, sh we should know so far. Okay, Peter was the first apostle to the Gentiles. God sent him to Cornelius uh, to, to present the message. The message Peter presented was faith, believe on Lord Jesus Christ. But the first Gentiles became believers, were filled with the Holy Spirit at that time. Peter knew they were, they were saved because they spoke in tongues. So that's what happened. And then Peter told the Jews about it. And then uh, they were amazed because that Peter and the rest of the Jewish believers never expected Gentiles to be part of the church. So then, then what we find out is that now some of the Jewish believers from Jerusalem uh, and uh, James were going up there trying to impose circumcision and uh, Moses' law on these Gentiles, believers. And that became an argument, and they went and debated that out with, with James and, the, and the, the Jerusalem church and Paul, and they concluded, okay, the Gentiles don't have to get circumcised, but they've got to do this and this and that, but they don't have to become legalistic Jews uh, uh, like us. But, but then they still were doing it themselves. The Jerusalem church all these Pharisees that were believers now were all still legalistic Jews and holding on to Judaism. They never gave up Judaism. So now we get into the book of Galatians. The entire book of Galatians is really about this one problem. And that is that Paul is saying the, the, uh, the law is our schoolmaster to make us understand that we need the Savior because we can't follow the law. No, so now that was the purpose of the law. You've got to understand that. Now, stop trying to mix law or your Judaism with this Christianity. It's either got to be Christ or it's got to be the law. It can't be a combination of them too. So, you want to you want to be Jews or you want to be Christians? You can't mix them together. From the very beginning, the Jews never left Judaism. And Paul, in Book of Galatians, is saying it's faith alone in Jesus. Faith alone in Christ alone, not Judaism. Okay? Then we go, does anybody think that anything, I made any mistakes up to this point before I go into the book of Hebrews? No. Okay. Now we go to the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 9, verse 16 and 17. It says, For where a testament is, 
there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Okay, now why is this important and how does it relate to what we're talking about now? I talk too much. I wish someone else would jump in on this. Okay, the death of the testator. Do you know what a last will and testament is? Okay, maybe Joseph and I, we have a last will and testament. You young guys, maybe you haven't bothered with that yet. But the last will and testament, okay? When does my will and, te will and testament go into effect? When you pass on. Does it have any effect on anything right now? No. No. Only when I'm dead does the testament go into effect. Okay? So in Hebrews, uh, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. And, and, and a lot of people argue about who wrote it. But to me, it's clear that Paul wrote it. But he's saying here that the, the, the t New Testament started with the death of the testator. When Jesus died, that's the division point. Okay? So people want to ask about rightly dividing the Word of God. You hear this term all the time. And I, I'm going to declare that almost everybody who who's talks about rightly divide, rightly divide, most of them are wrongly dividing. And many of them are over dividing. I see one division, and that's the cross. And that is that people before the cross look forward to this blood sacrifice for the sins and, and the Savior, and then we look back to this the, the, the fact that he did give us this blood sacrifice. So you either look forward to the to the Jesus and the cross, or we look back to the cross and say it's finished. Okay? That's the dividing point. That's the testament, okay? So in the book of Hebrews, much like the book of Galatians. Paul is addressing the same problem, and that is Judaism mixing with Christianity. This is all, the entire book of Galatians about that one thing. Legalism, Pharise uh, the, uh, the, the Pharisees, Judaizers, foolish Galatians, you know. So, and then in Hebrews he does the same thing. The first chapter is all about identifying Jesus, who he is. He's God. He's not an angel. Then as you go on, you find out he's all talking about getting, this was the purpose of Judaism, but now Jesus is our high priest. Uh, we did all these sacrifices, but no, Jesus made the final sacrifice. Forget about that. Get rid of that. You don't need that anymore. Don't mix it. Okay? And why would he bother to do this? Why would you tell people, don't mix Judaism with Christianity? Because they're doing it. <laughs> what? That's a, he wouldn't tell them, don't do it if nobody's doing it. Nobody's doing it. Yeah. So in Galatians, he's confronting the, the, the Jewish believers who are trying to keep Judaism and mixed with Christianity and say, no, don't mix them. It's either Christ or the law. You, you can't mix them. And then he goes on, does the same thing in the book of Hebrews and makes exactly the same point. Now let's go to Hebrews 10, verse 8, 9, and 10. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which we will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So it's talking about taking away the first that he may establish the second. So you see the same argument is being made in Hebrews. Taking away the first. Okay, let's get rid of Judaism. you got to give it up. You cannot hold on to your Judaism and become a Christian. you got to give up Judaism and really put your faith in, in Jesus. Your faith is not in Jesus if you're holding on to Judaism. You're mixing it and you're nullifying it. You're frustrating it. Christ is of no effect to you. 
if you don't put your faith in him instead of relying on your Judaism still. Okay? Normally, in these talks here, we have a lot of people talking back and giving me answers. I don't, I can't, sur I'm surprised that nobody's uh, really uh, uh, commenting much on this. I'd love to, Luke, but I talk too much. I, 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 get, yeah, yeah. I, I would talk constantly <laughs> if uh, given the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's funny, but um, I, I've never, I, I, to tell you the truth, I've never seen anyone take this in this direction before, to tell you the truth, um, because people generally, and I, again, I don't want to jump ahead of you. Um, I'm afraid to say anything because I don't want to jump ahead of you. <laughs> um, because, I mean, well, I won't go there. I'll say, isn't this the, the whole point behind the statements of Christ? Uh, the three, those three words, it is finished. Um, the last sacrifice, the death on the cross, the veil of the temple torn in the two, in two from top to bottom. Aren't these the symbols of this is done? You don't need to do this anymore. This is not what I, I have completed this. I've finished it. All those, those, um, those blueprints I showed you in the temple uh, were all leading up to this crucial moment, this one moment. And by you continuing down this path, you're, co you're continuing to go backwards and you're continuing, you're, you're trying to go back instead of go forward. I have finished that. I've completed it. And you want to hang one of these things like an anchor. Um, well, I, I don't want to be a, the devil's advocate, but uh, let me for a second be a MacArthur advocate. Uh, he, if he were here, he would say, well, you know, there are still rules in effect. Uh, take, for instance, uh, those who take communion unworthily uh, with sin, quote, in their lives, uh, are sick and some have died. That would certainly establish uh, the presence in the church, both Jewish and Gentile, that sin is still uh, in effect and we need to have rules uh, so that we don't uh, come under condemnation, not in the next world, but in this one. Okay, brother, uh, we're not talking about um, reaping what you sow. Uh, we're not talking about treasures in heaven. We're not talking about chastisement from God. We're talking about salvation. Mm -hmm. And, and okay. so let me, let me make this, read the, let me reread one thing I said early on here. Okay, this is Acts 15, verse 1. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, quote, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Right. This that is, is, with that is the issue, Brother Joseph. We're not talking about, oh, yeah, of course we should follow laws and be good citizens and, and do good deeds. Of course. Right. That falls but the point stewardship, I think, uh, good yeah. stewardship of what God's given yeah. us. But the, the point I'm making here, and this is my concluding, concluding statement, so that when we look at these verses in James, if you feel the need, now, my conclusion is, uh, we know that right from the very, very beginning, the Jews that believed, many of these believers never gave up Judaism. And they tried to impose Judaism on the Gentile believers, and they said, finally, said, okay, we won't impose it on the Gentiles, but the Jewish believers still got to follow Judaism. And that's what Paul fought about in Galatians, and that's what Paul fought about in Hebrews. And to me, James is, a, he's a, a Jew who would not give up his Judaism. And that's how I see the book of James. Now, should it be in the scriptures? That's the question. Um, Brother Mitch, Brother Mitch and I, by the way, uh, I've come to this kind of this viewpoint on, on James uh, through hours and hours of discussion, just trying to figure this all out by talking to Brother Mitch for a long time. And uh, uh, it seems to me that this is the only way that it really makes sense to me now. Uh, I used to say that, well, James is a pastor talking to uh, uh, Christians, and, and he, they're already saved, so now he's just talking about doing good work so that they can grow and mature. But, but to me, uh, to, do, to answer that way, uh, I have to have some uh, answer some verses in James that seem to be so clear-cut contradictions to Paul. 
These were so such clear-cut contradictions that Martin Luther, as we said, and others said, James shouldn't be in the Bible. It's a clear contradiction to Paul. And that's the, how I started off this study at the very beginning last week. I said, are there contradictions in the scriptures? So uh, some people are going to argue, well, no, James doesn't contradict Paul. You just have to you just have to understand it in context, and, and there's an answer. And for years, I've tried to give good answers. But my conclusion right now, whether you guys agree with this or not, you, you can have to make your own conclusion, but I'm, I'm believing that James wrote a book to the Jewish believers who were still following. You know who they are? They're just like the people today called Messianic Jews. Have you ever gone to a Messianic Jewish congregation? They believe in Jesus, just like, just like us, except they're still practicing all their Judaism, and they think it's necessary for them because they're Jews. Okay? So they never would will, were willing to give up Judaism, and that's what Paul said they had to do. They said you can't have it both ways. It's, it's either faith or it's, or, it's, or it's works. It can't be both. Choose Judaism or Christ. So to me, if we look at the book of James in that way and say James is uh, one of the people that Paul was criticizing, for, can't we see now that, that James and that the people from Jerusalem wanted to kill Paul because he's telling Jewish believers that they don't have to follow the law and they want to kill him over it? Can I ask you a question here, Luke? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Listen, I, I understand. I, I agree with what you're saying, but I, I'm just speaking what I'm thinking. Uh, James, while his book may or may not uh, be uh, appropriate for the canon, he was unquestionably an apostle. And in some of the scripture that you had read earlier, it uh, establishes the apostles' authority when they said, we did not command them this and thus. And Christ did unquestionably give all the apostles uh, uh, an apostolic position, including James. Now, whether his book is uh, canonical or what, uh, his authority is unquestioned. Uh, Christ did pick James as an apostle. Uh, well, um, I don't really know where it says that in Scripture. Uh, it does say that uh, Jesus appeared to certain people at, at, in the resurrection. He appeared to James, but it doesn't say what was said or he gave him an apostleship. He is referred to as apostle in the Scriptures. Uh, uh, so, But uh, I don't see anywhere in Scriptures Christ says, I'm declaring you as an apostle. But the point is, whether he's an apostle or not is not, not my issue. My issue is... I think it's pretty clear that James and these first Jewish believers were not willing to leave Judaism, and Paul, Paul fought with them over it, and, and that the book of James, I believe James wrote from that viewpoint. And uh, therefore, should it be in the canon? I would say, yeah, it should be in the canon, but it shouldn't be looked at as, as a lesson for our salvation. It should be a lesson for us to learn the history of the early church. Because who's Paul talking about in Galatians and, and, uh, and Hebrews? He's talking about James and, and th all those people. So, if you, so know, if, you, if you know that Paul's talking about James, then you have to look at James in that light, that Paul and James were not uh, on the same page. Now, yeah. the other way you can do it is you can, you can take each verse in James that's, that's a problem verse that says, faith without works is dead, and so on and so on. Uh, and, and all those verses that we, we have gone through before and that we're probably going to continue to go through, and you can try to answer them and, and, and explain them away. I've done that for years, but I think this is the most uh, logical explanation that, as I see it now. Okay, that's the presentation I wanted to make on this. Now I want to leave it open for everybody's discussion and possible and, and conclusions about this. And I want to start with Brother Austin because... This is the quietest you've been in months. I, I'm just, it was about a, uh, it was hard for me to follow along, Brother Luke. It was a very thorough Bible study. I was kind of confused at some points. But yeah, I mean, I get what you're starting to see at the, the overview of it. Uh, the book of James is uh, very confusing. I like how you saw that he might have been a, uh, as you call, a, did, you, did you say he was a Masonic Jew or just a Jew that wouldn't let go of the law? Uh, I liken him to what we see today with the Messianic Jewish congregation. 
Okay, that's fine. Uh, hey, man, I can see that. I really can. It makes sense. Uh, I never even thought about it that way, but it, since you said he's also the head of the Church of Jerusalem, that would make sense because Jerusalem's still pretty large on uh, the Jewish community. One thing I did notice, and I read this just recently, and I thought I could put this out there. Uh, it's following James, and it's part of my it's my favorite verse of James, and it's the imputation to Abraham. I just noticed that, uh, I didn't I didn't come up with this. This was uh, uh, brother uh, Stewart's on Jesus as Savior, but this is what he says about that part: is that uh, carefully notice in James two twenty one. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? This event took place in Genesis 22, 8 through 10, but we read in James 2, 23, and the scripture was fulfilled with saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So that was that's the salvation verse of this. But then what Mr. Stewart came up with about that is that uh, now, notice in Genesis 15:6, and he believed the Lord, and it was counted unto righteousness. This event took place before uh, the good works were the, even mentioned. So I think that overall, James was trying to at least. I think that that's what everybody sees it as: is uh, you know, we should do the we should do the good works and everything. But still, James held true to the line that faith alone needed to be established before anything, because if you didn't have the faith your works would have been uh, dead also. Now, he says faith without works is dead. That, that could be, you know, that could easily sound like a contradiction to the rest of the Bible, but re regardless of that point, uh, I think that it kind of fits how he kind of has it worded because in Genesis 15, 6, Abraham was saved, and then in Genesis 22, 8, those are kind of the works that followed salvation. But we can't, there's one thing that I will put up this, we can't follow James for every believer. Because there are believers that have been saved, but they've maybe never done the works or display a type of Christian lifestyle to know we were saved. And that's why I hold true to your brother Luke's teaching is that we shouldn't question someone's salvation based upon how we see fit. It's upon uh, God sees the heart and he knows the truth. But uh, amen. I, I Overall, how you wrapped it up together, I understand. But the reason why I was kind of quiet is I was kind of going along and I was kind of confused, kind of like how you – Master, but once you master, is beautiful in the aspect of I see what you're trying to get at, and uh, I'm with you there. Uh, James is kind of a, if he was like a difficulty on a play, say you're playing a video game, he would be kind of be the expert. He wouldn't be the easiest level to play, but uh, you know, there's it's still there in the Bible, and it still can be used if anything for uh, for learning and correction and reproof, as in Second Timothy three sixteen. Okay, let me let me read. Very good. I like your. Uh... Uh, very good points. Uh, I tell you, I, I've liked uh, David uh, Stewart's uh, stuff for a long, long time, too. Uh, he had a web, pay, uh, uh, a YouTube channel, and I think he closed it down. Now he just has a website, right? Uh, I know that he still is in uh, contact from what I previously noticed is the brother Hennessley. He, he uploads a lot of uh, pastor... I slip a name, but he... Uh, brother Hennessley is still in uh, contact with Mr. Stewart. I know that he does still have YouTube pages up, but they've been abandoned for quite some time. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, let me let me ask this. Remember when I started the study? I said uh, uh, I'm not talking about today, but I talk, I'm talking about last episode, and I and I actually uh, reviewed it again today. Uh, this uh, this question. I started off by saying, look, uh, MacArthur, Parker, and Washer. Are basically their their viewpoint is really we're on probation. John, Peter, and Paul say no, we have salvation, we're saved. Okay, uh, but then the next question I asked is, are there contradictions in the Bible regarding salvation? Now we can we can uh, answer that a lot of different ways. I've always taken the viewpoint that uh, there are no contradictions, there's just explanations and sometimes we don't have all the explanations until we study and figure it all out. Uh, but my question, if, if there's either contradictions or there's explanations to explain away the con apparent contradictions, okay, or you have, uh, let me make this point here, uh, I'm going to quote, um, let me see, it's Ephesians, no, it's, it's Romans 3, 3.28, Paul says, we conclude 
that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And then I look now at uh, James, um, oops, uh, let me see, where is it? Uh, I'm, okay, I keep on clicking on the wrong thing here. Okay, um, give me a second here. Okay, there it is. Um, okay, Paul says, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. James says in James 2.25, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now, Paul says you're justified by faith without the deeds of the law. James says we're justified by works and not by faith only. So, now, you either have to find a way of explaining that, or you can also take the viewpoint, like some people say, James has to be taken out of the Bible. Or as a hyper-dispensationalist says, James is not to us, only Paul. Okay? Or you can take, uh, uh, as I've just presented tonight, you can say, James belongs in the Bible so we understand the history of the church. This was the condition of the church. James was a Jewish believer, and he never left Judaism, like all these other people that we studied tonight. And therefore... We do not get our salvation by listening to James, who never left Judaism. Paul fought with James and the other Jewish believers in Galatians and Hebrews over this very issue. Okay? I mean, I know one thing that's a connection to James is that uh, if he, I, I will actually hold true that he might have been a Jew because, weirdly enough, most modern day Pharisees use the book of James to justify the faith alone group. So. It's kind of like uh, James is still with us today in the sense of the modern Pharisees are using supposedly a old school Pharisee book to try to condemn somebody by faith alone. The Catholics love it. Uh, the MacArthur Piper Washer Group love James. It's usually the people who we think of the most as being a Pharisee of the day. Well, they, maybe James was a was a Jew and in a sense he might have been a Pharisee, and they're using a Pharisee's book to try to condemn. Other believers. I never even thought about it that way. But guess what? Now. Guess guess what, Austin? You just stole my conclusion. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it, it was a, it was an excellent, brother Luke. It was a masterpiece. <laughs> that you have that. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, you know, Eric Eric's been doing it to me all night. Always a step ahead of where I want to go, and now you just stole the entire conclusion. And that I'm is sorry. it. I'm that sorry. is it. That. Who loves the book of James? MacArthur, Piper, Washer, Ray Comfort, every legalist, every, every uh, work salvationist, every lordship salvation, every Mormon, all these people, they go right to James. James is their pope. That's their book because he is not teaching real biblical Christianity. He's teaching Judaism and Jesus. And Paul said, that's wrong. You can't have them both. Choose. You can be their Judaism or you can have Christ, but you can't mix them. Amen. All right. Well, uh, we finished this subject of James a little bit early, but now I have another thing to ask as a general thing. Unless anybody else wants to discuss, rehash anything I've said so far. I feel this has been a great... Great study, except I hate to say that because I've been talking 95% of the time, so that would sound egotistical. No, I'd say it's wonderful. I just actually, I, that I understand it now. It's been like, wow, okay, I can yeah, see what you're getting at because I was confused, uh, not to be mean or anything, but I've been kind of confused by what you're getting at, uh, Bro Luke. But now I see, I can see it now, and of course, I totally agree. It's a wonderful teaching that we should, uh, that we should all view at that point. Yeah. Now I'll tell you what. Uh, this may sound also egotistical, and so you know I've been called a lot of other things, so I might as well be called egotistical too. But um, after these hangouts are over, uh, usually the next day I go back and watch it again. And the the reason I do is because I found that uh, um, I get a lot more out of it by watching it again because most of the time there's all this interaction going on. Tonight it was mostly me talking, but but uh, 
when we have a lot of people interacting, and then I'm listening and I'm taking notes, and I'm also looking at my outline and figuring out where I'm going to go next, my mind is off, off some like like Joseph, like Joseph's mind sometimes. He's off on some little other little world for a while, or, or like or like Austin was studying some other scriptures for a moment while we tra he's trying to get his verses together. So what happens is when we do a hangout. I find that when I watch it the next day, there's all kinds of great stuff that I missed because uh, my mind was preoccupied and I end up benefiting more and appreciating more. Not because of things I've said, but because of things you guys have said that I missed because I, w I was you know, focusing on moderating and I missed a, a very important point. So I think of all the studies, this might be one that I would recommend maybe most for people to go back and watch and because then you can see, because this was systematic, I, I think that I presented this in a way so that we could reach this conclusion. This, that's, the, that's how I came to this conclusion. And a lot of this is also the result of hours and hours of discussing all this with, with uh, Brother Mitch, who uh, well, like suspected James all along. And I and I and I uh, kind of uh, uh, you know I, I kind of argued with him and tried to get, say well Jane look I know what you think but to me I I think that there I can explain every one of these problem verses you know I know sometimes I try to explain them and I I've, even myself I'm not really convinced that it's the best answer I can come up with but to me if we look at it in this in this uh, through this lens then James has no problem because. Uh, he's uh, he's not really talking about Christianity. He's talking about uh, you know lordship salvation and uh, Judaism and, and mixing it with Christianity. Well, Luke, I'm I'm happy to say that unlike the uh, two others on the panel who were spoilers, uh, I've rather been behind or to the left of you uh, throughout a lot of this, so as not to spoil your outline uh, conclusions. Uh, what I what I will notice. Here real quickly is I think I'll, I don't know that I agree with your outcome or not. Uh, I think I'm going to need to study a little bit further. Uh, I'm reading the first uh, first couple of verses in Acts where it talks about how Christ uh, through the Holy Spirit has given commandments unto the apostles whom he being Christ has chosen. Uh, and if, if uh, James was appointed by God or by Christ as an apostle, that may change things in my mind a little bit. But then I'm reading every book that Paul wrote, and it starts out, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ uh, in Ephesians, Corinthians, and so on. I go to James, and it says, James, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I think a lot of this depends on whether or not he was ordained by Christ as an apostle. Well, pa apostles are uh, fallible men, too. Look at all the things that Peter did wrong. You know? You know? Oh, that's how, you know, I'm looking like the Catholic Church does. I'm considering them infallible. I was, when you're, I was you're right. the same thing. I, I guess at this point you're trying to get everybody's take. I, I guess um, Brother Mitch kind of had the inside scoop on this. He's been kind of quiet. So he's, I guess he had the inside scoop when you guys talk about this often. You know, it, when you uh, mentioned this and I first got into it, it, it brought me back into James to kind of reevaluate and look over everything in James. And it's a very controversial subject. Anytime you start to begin to say, well, should we include something with Scripture? Should we not include something? We know how, how uh, importantly God holds to how we treat Scripture taking something out or adding something to it. So you always want to be really careful with that. But I think when you look at James, in light of his words, I, I heard a person, I forget what website it was, but I was on another Grace uh, uh, website, and the person mentioned they thought that, like what you said, that James might have been just a matter of inconvenient placement in Scripture. Instead of putting it as, as you said, a letter of instruction toward us in some way, it should have been more... Um, closer to the origins of you know, the first developing of the church and how views were affected by things. Um, which you said, as far as um, apostles, they're not they're not infallible. They do things wrong. Of, of course, they all do things wrong. In fact, Peter was still doing things something wrong, which Paul called him one, which is what we read today. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think you, 
I think one of the important thing is one of the important things is in the context of testing genes with scripture versus scripture, he fails the test. It, 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 when when you look at what James writes. And people try to rationalize and say, well, no, this isn't really what he means. What he's trying to say is he's trying to say that works. And and, and I other, I understand what uh, Brother Austin was saying, um, but I think we begin to try to say what I got from where he talks about Abraham, for instance. Um, I got that he was trying to force works and faith together. He was trying to force things together, which simply weren't the case originally in the Old Testament. It said he believed that that was imputed to him for righteousness. It didn't. God didn't equate him doing anything with justifying himself. Um, so in looking at that, and then you look at what Paul says about the situation between Peter, between the Jews uh, that were Christians, and what was being done, and that they specifically were telling people, you can't be saved without these things. You have to go back in James and say, this is exactly what he's saying. He's not trying to say, oh, no, it's, it works in faith. He really is saying, mm -hmm. got to be works in faith because you encounter this in Acts, as we read. Paul says this was the problem with the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So it really creates a controversial issue. It's a great issue, and it needs to be talked about because this really causes a lot of butting heads uh, in the churches today. I mean, it's 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 a you go on YouTube, you go on different sites. This is a huge topic, and it gets it's very very heated. Very very heated. heated. <laughs> Eric, Eric, aren't you aren't you nervous about uh, convening a third Nicene Council here and uh, and uh. <laughs> out of uh, the canon that that um, has been once and delivered for all? Let me uh, let me uh, put a stop to something here real quick because I'm afraid that uh, Brother Mitch and I might be misunderstood, and I don't want this to get to anybody take this wrong. Uh, Brother Mitch is, is not saying that James should not be in the canon, and I am not saying James should not be in the canon. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Mitch said this years ago. He said, yeah, he questioned whether it should be in the canon, and he cited Martin Luther as an ex reason for, for that, right. uh, his, his explanation of it. Uh, but James has been challenged from the very beginning. But uh, there's very, very, all these different ways of looking at James. MacArthur, Piper, and Washer, they're going to say James is the best book of all. Uh, a... a uh, a hyper dispensationalist is going to say, "No, James is not for our, uh, our for, to us for about salvation. It's it's for us. We can learn from it, but it's not it's not to us about salvation for us." He's talking to the twelve right. tribes, right. but they're implying that the twelve tribes, the Jews, have a different way of getting saved. You know that there's yeah. a there's a different gospel for them. It's faith and works and Judaism, all that, and it's a different way. But uh, right. so that's how a hyper D would explain it. No, there's a different gospel. It's uh, it's the gospel of the kingdom, and, and uh, these people have legalism and Judaism and stuff. And and but but with Paul, it's just the grace of God. So that's how the hyper D would say explain James. And then I, in the past, would explain James. Well, there are problems, but I think I can explain each one of the verses. Uh, and then there's uh, and then now, as as we've said, uh, I think that the way to look at it is that. James and these other Jewish believers wouldn't let go of Judaism, and Paul fought them over it. And we shouldn't look at James to get our doctrine from, but we can. We, James should be in the canon because this is part of church history. And and if you if you look at James through the lens we've looked at tonight and understand it this way, then we can see the importance of James because that now we know who who Paul was talking about in Galatians and, and Hebrews. Right. And please understand, let, let me get this rec the record straight. I'm not trying to insinuate that it should be removed. I, I, I don't want to, I, I hope nobody's thinking I'm saying that. I'm not saying it should be removed. Um, and I don't, I don't agree with everything Martin Luther uh, uh, said either. So it, it's not, it's not, that's not the case. Um, just, I was just saying in light of looking at what he's saying, I think, I think what you said, it's more a historical record of things that were going on. It's not something directed to us. Our, our direction, of course, is, is from Paul. From the mm -hmm. other letters that speak about faith, you know, um, grace through faith. All we need to do is believe, and that's it. So, absolutely, I agree with that. And there's nothing to say that um, James didn't somewhere down the road uh, possibly break away from this the, this this issue that he had. Um, 
it does not really say. No one really says anything about that. Um, if he's if he's still acknowledged as an apostle, um, that's a possibility as well. So I mean, it's just one of those things. Where I don't think it's direction for us to take, um, as you said. I, I totally agree with what you're saying. But no, I'm in no way saying that it should be removed. Or or <laughs> I'm not trying to. I'm, I don't want people to think I'm saying that I'm not. Yeah. Um, uh, Brother Mitch made a video today. Joseph, I think you mentioned it, uh, uh, and he's talking about how uh, we believers should be able to talk about things and be civil uh, and uh, and uh, patient with each other, uh, uh, even allowing disagreement. And I'll tell you what, if, if years ago uh, I took the attitude when, when I heard that Mitch says, I don't think James should be in Scripture. Uh, Martin Luther put a divider that was challenged and it shouldn't even be in there. If I took the attitude that, uh, well, he's a heretic, I don't want to have anything to do with him, uh, I would have lost the opportunity of having uh, many, many hours of fellowship with him, uh, exchanging ideas back and forth, working things out by discussing them. And uh, I'll tell you that, that uh, he's helped me understand this uh, better, and I, and I know that my mind has been changed not only on this, but on two or three other major, uh, major uh, doctrinal issues, my mind has changed because I was willing to talk to people without calling them names. Without, I remember I've talked to some people about things that they didn't didn't agree with, and all of a sudden their leg starts twitching. They get like real nervous and get uptight, and they get all emotional, and they cannot even have a conversation because they're so emotionally involved in it. So I think it's uh, very healthy and wise for for all of us to be able to have these conversations and now I whether anybody agrees with the, the the premise I laid tonight I don't really care uh, if you agree or not it's it's the conclusion that I've, I've uh, reached uh, through a lot of study now and you know what maybe I'll change my mind later on if some other evidence points me in a different direction uh, but I, I think what we need to do now since our, our two hours is about up um, we'll We'll make a few concluding remarks and, uh, and and then end the show, and then we can talk privately for a little bit if anybody wants to. Okay, uh, uh, we're going to continue with this topic. The topic is these controversial verses, uh, and I don't care if someone wants to bring up some, a verse from James. Uh, I think that all those verses are answered in the in the uh, study tonight. But if, if you want to bring them up and we want to go through them and try to explain them in some other way, hear other viewpoints on them, that might be okay too. But I'm really interested in getting into a lot of the other uh, controversial verses, like when Jesus said, "Go and sin no more," uh, or uh, uh, you know. Uh, be perfect just as your Father in Heaven is perfect. You know, uh, There's a lot of other verses apart from James that people can throw at us and that uh, I hope you guys have been compiling a list and then I, I hope on the next episode we can start discussing all of those. But to me, uh, all the problems that people have with James are, are answered by my viewpoint on it now. Now, let's go one at a time and make any final remarks here and, and then I'll end the show, okay? Uh, we'll start with Brother Austin. Amen. I'll just leave a, uh, since it's been centered kind of around the law for the most part of this show, uh, just explaining what it is, I'll just give that verse I gave a little earlier. Uh, Romans 10.4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And uh, regardless on the law, we know that it's uh, the law in Galatians 5.14 is fulfilled even in one word, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So, uh, we just we need we we get preoccupied sometimes with ourselves and our walk, our Christian walk, instead of uh, resting in Jesus entirely. And I uh, I came up with this phrase uh, not too long ago: "Leave it to Jesus. Uh, leave it to Jesus for everything: salvation, faith, earnesty, protection, guidance. Just leave it to Jesus." And that's what I'm going to leave it on. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, every every time you talk about this resting in Jesus, and I see your icon there, I think how beautiful and appropriate it is. And you know, my icon, I don't know. Sometimes it pops up. I don't know how how the this uh, the the rules of icons popping up or not. Because sometimes I talk and my icons up. Sometimes I have my videos up. But uh, my icon is. Jesus reaching out with his nail pierced hand and a person reaching out to embrace Jesus. And so this is how we get saved by answering the call. Jesus wants us to come to him, we come to him, and, and then but we, once we get saved, then we look at uh, 
uh, Brother Austin's icon there, and that shows you the rest, the comfort we have in the arms of Jesus. So that's that's just I always love that. Every time I see your icon and you, you talk about resting, it's uh, <laughs> it's just a beautiful a picture of our rest. Okay, Brother Joseph, Brother Joseph, your 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 final remarks. Well, uh, I got to tell you, Brother Luke, uh, we totally agree on the basics uh, of salvation. There's no question about that. But uh, James remains an enigma to me. Uh, because of partly because of Acts chapter one verses one and two, and uh, so I still have a lot more thinking to do. I may just be slow, but uh, I'm going to pick up my cross and uh, work at figuring this out. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do want to say that I can easily relate to the Pharisees who became believers at that time because my past is in a works salvationist mode that I was rescued from. Thank God. But I can easily slip back into that way of thinking so easily, and uh, and this uh, study uh, reminds me of that. But uh, I've really enjoyed uh, a lot of enlightening things that I didn't realize, like Peter being the first <laughs> apostle to the uh, Gentiles. Okay, all right, brother. Thank you for participating, brother Eric. Well, I think um, this has been a, a great study for me. I've actually learned uh, quite a bit. The way you put things into perspective in this whole thing really has changed, really brought James to me in an entirely different uh, view that I've never thought of it before. Um, I, th I think it's, um, you know, people will, uh, it's a discussion that needs to be had because it can be confusing. It is one of those things that people argue over a lot. Um, these kind of discussions, I think, is going uh, are, are going to help people a lot in trying to resolve some of these issues. Already resolved some things for me today. Uh, it helped make made things a lot clearer to me. I think the idea which you originally started the premise, you started with simplicity, the simplicity of our belief. Um, it's not meant to be um, complicated. You know, it's 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 grace through faith. Christ alone. Uh, it, it's it's meant to be simple. We tend to complicate things ourselves. And we just need to be very careful in Scripture that, that we don't um, – we keep things in context, find out more about them. And I think Brother Joseph has the right idea, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to – you know, there's no way I'm going to discount James. Um, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it's important, and uh, it needs to be looked at over and over again. It's one of those things in Scripture. It's one of those things – I was talking to Austin about this the other, the other night when we were talking. Um, I've gone through the Bible I don't know how many times, and uh, in, the, in the 20 years I've been uh, – uh, walking with Christ, and and it never ceases to something will open up to me that never opened up to me a certain way before. And who knows, maybe in in reevaluating this uh, James, something will open up. I'm sure the Lord will lead me to that and uh, and give me that knowledge uh, when He feels I'm ready. And uh, and uh, that's about it. Okay, very good, brother Bill. Yes. Any, I'd any, say sola uh, fide all the way. Pardon me. Sola fide all the way. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Please uh, forgive me. I'm a little shy. You know, this, I'm not used to this. <laughs> all right, brother. Well, what did you think? Were you able to uh, follow along the whole time? I didn't um, there were there were moments when I got a little confused. I was, I was flipping through my Bible and I lost uh, uh, where I was at. But um, yeah, I, I agree with you guys. I'm on the same page with you, Luke. Well, uh, again, I want to uh, suggest that everybody watch this from the beginning again if you have the time I think it'll be more cohesive if you actually will watch it and concentrate the whole time because uh, you know when I'm doing it I get distracted and I know sometimes you guys have something happening and you get distracted so I think it'll uh, make even more sense if you watch it again okay. uh, but I'll tell you I'm going to quote my favorite ver verse from the book of James be, be quick to listen slow to speak, and slow to anger. Yes. You're, you're not jabbing at me, are you, Brother Luke? <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm jabbing at the whole world right now because the, 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 the actual norm for mankind, our human nature, is the exact opposite. Instead of being quick to listen, uh, slow to speak, and slow to anger, we're slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to anger. That's our normal human state. We need to 
180 degrees, and that's the verse from James, I think, that is the most beneficial for all of us. Um, okay, let me just say finally that uh, thank everybody for participating. And uh, uh, the shows, as you know, if you watch this last video I did, I changed the schedule to, uh, to be uh, uh, Sunday and Wednesday at uh, 5 p.m. Pacific. That's 8 p.m. Eastern. So it will be Sunday and Wednesday instead of Sunday and Friday. And then uh, next, uh, we're going to continue on with this topic. Instead of me trying to juggle two different topics, like I was doing another show on Mormonism, well, we're going to put that on the back shelf and, and come back to that later so that we can work our way through this. So uh, if you have any other problem verses, uh, uh, whether it's in James or anything else, uh, make a list of them, and then we'll go through them one at a time and discuss them, okay? So let me just say this finally to everybody who's watching the video. Uh, if you are not a Christian right now, then I'm going to tell you how to become a Christian. And it's very easy. You simply put all your faith in Christ. Uh, now, a lot of people have faith, but they put their faith in the wrong thing. Most people are putting their faith in their own ability to live a good life, uh, putting their faith in their performance or their personal merit. But you have to reject that and instead make Jesus Christ the object of your faith. And if you do that, then he gives you eternal life. He promises you eternal life in heaven. And, and it, there's no strings attached. You're not required to join a religion, become a religious person, follow religious rules. You're only required to put your faith in the Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. If you do that, please make a comment uh, on the video tonight. And uh, we'll be happy. To, we want to celebrate with you, okay? So uh, thank you guys for participating. Uh, I'm going to keep it on private. I'm going to end the broadcast now. I'll keep it on private so we can talk alone for a minute, okay? Uh, bye now.